Nick, hi, it's lovely to have you on. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. I uh, always love talking about pharmacy and branding and, and all that. So it was pleased to join you. Awesome. Well, um, let's get straight into it. I'd love to just get started with finding out about your history, your story. Let us, sure. let us know how you got started and we, how you got to where you are now. Sure. I studied, went to school in Queensland um, and studied in Brisbane. I had an early opportunity to get into my own business at the age of 22. So my first bosses uh, wanted to buy a farm scene. They said, well, you know, do you want to come and manage it? Be managing partner. I had no money, like literally no money. So uh, <laughs> back then the, there was a bit of a power with the bank that you go to bank manager, can you give this young guy 50 grand? We're about to buy a farm scene. He needs some money. And so that's literally how it started. Right place, right time, but also make your opportunities. So first stores were Amcal and I got to sort of see the good and the bad of branding. Then we got to Terry White Pharmacies, so two Amcals and Terry White. And that was some great experience. It did very well. Towards the end of the Terry White, I sort of get, was whinging about some of the things I think they could do better. And which so I decided to create my own, start creating my own brand. I always had a passion for marketing and business. I did a Bachelor of Business after my pharmacy degree I did in marketing. So I thought I'd put money where the mouth is, made a hell of a lot of mistakes, lost a lot of money, which we can delve into later on, and you know, created the V Pharmacy brand, which hit the hit the mark in some things, missed the mark in other things. And we created a live pharmacy. Then we I joined with another group and we expanded it to eleven stores, I think we got up to. Dabbled in franchising earlier on, which I didn't enjoy. And now my latest one is a Vitality Pharmacy uh, warehouse, which we've just launched this month, converting my four stores that I own and we're actually having some fun and I've used a lot of the lessons from previous. We haven't spent a fortune, but we're pretty stoked with the outcome and that, you know, all the signage is rolling out the moment. This is the first day I've worn my new shirt. So I was, uh, <laughs> I was pretty happy. Good timing. So we got a treat today. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Pharmacist <laughs> jackets are still coming because we still like the traditional white with a little bit of uh, teal in there, but yeah, happy, happy to be in the new colors today. Love it. Love it. So you're obviously coming from a very seasoned background, not just as a pharmacist, but as a pharmacy owner. And, yeah. you know, you've gone through this progression of, of starting as a very young entrepreneur. And now you're, you know, you're on to, it sounds like you're the third or fourth. Third brand. Yeah. Third brand that you're starting. So if, if you could go back to sort of thinking of yourself as that 22 year old who just started his first brand, what was that like? Like what, what talk us through kind of what was going through your mind when you thought to yourself, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to start my first, I'm going to own my first pharmacy. And what was that like for you? Yeah. Look, I, I suppose one of the lessons which goes to your question is I thought I needed all these external people to help create a brand. I thought I needed to pay a lot of money and we did. Some of it was completely wasted and some of it wasn't, but I suppose what we've learned there's a good process to create your own brand there's a discovery process you find out your the values you want what you want to achieve what do you want to give to your customer and you do all that before you start talking about what the logo is what the color is you know with at the moment when i've changed brands from a live pharmacy warehouse which i created um to this new brand we've gone out on my own people say you're sad about leaving alive and i i sort of say to them the brand in its core sense is letters and a bit of color. And it's what's, it, it's what stands behind that. That's important. That's the brand. It's not the logo. It's not the color of your store. It's, it's the values that stand behind it. And right back from those early days, you know, we did it the hard, expensive way. And as I said, wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think, but you, know, you get smarter and you learn, you don't have to do that. You've got to trust certain core people and don't pay for too many external consultants because they can bleed you dry. Okay, cool, cool. So, so I guess I feel like one of the core core learnings from that is really on. First of all, figure out what your values are because yeah. I think it's very easy as a first time entrepreneur to spend way too long focusing on your colors and your logos, as you were saying, and you know it's all just pretty colors and and and, and you know the pretty stuff. But that's actually not the important stuff, is it? It's it's the figuring out who your customer is and figuring out what they want and what they need and what you stand for as a company. Absolutely. And one of the biggest mistakes you can do is try and be everything to everyone. You just can't you can't do that. You'll you'll end up being nothing to everyone. 
that makes so sense. how did what was that what was that journey like for you in terms of figuring out you know in a in what can sometimes feel like a sea of pharmacy groups that all seem to be standing for the same thing and doing the same thing like what is how did you kind of figure out a way to differentiate yourself in that yeah look it's, it's a good question because I've seen so many pharmacy brands and we even said this ourselves when we we're young that we're you know we're different to the rest and we're unique and and with all due respect it's all bloody rubbish we've got the luxury of having a business core business that people look for and a lot of what a lot of what our business is is location a lot of our businesses you know you've got loyal staff and customers and you need to look look after them and grow so absolutely a brand can add and attract new customers but i think most of them out there don't um, i think probably there's only a few that you could really say if you do a brand switch you'll change your customer mix chemist warehouse is one price on is another you know your, your traditional pharmacy adds price on they pick up all these female customers with a with the front of shop cosmetics and all that in regard to the other brands and i don't say that we're any different at the moment we've, we've got some aspirations to develop some areas of our business you just need to be good at what you do and you need to need to have a good image and you and look after your customers and keep them so I, I that makes sense i don't think we do anything dramatically different to the others out there but we're good at what we do in regard to systems and back of office to try and run an efficient uh, model we've removed pricing and ordering from the stores and even at the size we are four we can do that efficiently so i don't say that we're any different or better than others but i think what we've got is a good clean image and we look after our our customers and and you know get aggressive on price it's not it's not rocket science maybe it's easy for me to say that after creating three brands but you, you learn you, you learn but yeah too many people just go well we're different we're unique when it's an interesting take and i actually i, I really appreciate your your honesty it's very refreshing because i think it, it can sometimes feel like oh i have to find something that's completely unique and different about me and it reminds me of the concept of a boring business i don't know if you if you follow that whole thing online about it's a whole movement about buy into boring businesses because you know they like they're sustainable and they're long long term and there oh, is yes, yes, element yes, yes, to it. Yes. And you know when you think about pharmacy, in yes. that sense, it really is a boring business in that it is it is it's more of a long term sustainable business model yes. that you know once you've built up your systems and processes, it does sort of last. I guess for me as a I wouldn't say a youngish, a young pharmacist. I'm kind of in that, you know, in the 30s range, but I'm still. Oh, you're young. still young. Come on, <laughs> I've been an owner for 31 years. <laughs> well, it feels that uh, even in my time when I graduated, it felt inaccessible to be able to get into a into a yeah. into pharmacy ownership. And I know now it's gotten. It feels even harder for those sort of just coming out of of uni. I guess I'm wondering if you could speak to that and what you think about that. Yeah, again, I, I like the question. I like to talk about this because it's it's been a bit of a journey since I've been in pharmacy. And I was, in, as I said, right place, right time, but make, you make your opportunities. I think we went through a significant period where a lot of young pharmacists didn't want to be owners. The work-life balance, the job satisfaction in pharmacy waned. And even, I, I went through that. I, I went through, why, why am I doing this? I think we're in a, we've come through the last maybe five years, I think we're heading for a golden era or, or even in there, forget the 60 day issue at the moment. But so we've seen a change in regard to the attitude of young farms as one to become partners. I, I myself are starting to go down the journey of looking for managing partners. And that's the way that my five year plan is to, is to have that to, to uh, take pressure off to help facilitate expansion. And, and we're proactively doing that. And I've seen there's a there's a um, a good broker that's now got a program that literally goes out and finds managing partners as, and attaches them to pharmacies. Now, there's some good models in regard because you know, pharmacies are bloody expensive. There's it's a lot of money. And for a young person coming in trying to save up a, a, a deposit to buy a pharmacy, it's, it's almost unattainable without some support in other ways. So I think there's some really good models coming out where a pharmacist can come in at 20, 30%. Need some skin and some need to show the ability that they can save a little bit of money. You know, we're yep. pretty cool for maybe fifty grand or a hundred grand, and attach themselves to a good partner that looks looks after them and facilitate. It's got to be a win win. So I'm really happy that that there's some success, and I'm going down that path. And there's a number of groups out there that have done it really well. You know, 
come to mind, Live Life Group and uh, Chem, Chem Pro, that they've managed to attract, they've got the model and managed to attract pharmacists. I'm not sure if they've all worked out, but that's the way. A young pharmacist that wants to come and buy a pharmacy on their own, you, you need family money behind me, you need, you need money. I think it's really, really difficult. I would suggest to young pharmacists that that's where they want to go, is attach yourself to the right pharmacist group. Have, make sure that over time there's been, and it's not as bad now, but if you go back 15, 20 years, there was a lot of, oh, come and work for me and we'll make you work 60 hours a week and after five years we'll give you 10% and we'll pay you less wages. And you know, It was just, it was, it was against the young pharmacists and I've heard some pretty horror stories over the years. I think that's much better now where you understand it's a win-win. So if you want to become a partner in a pharmacy, got the opportunity, but you should be paid, if you're a manager, but you should be paid what the market rate is to be a manager, you know, and then you should get a return on your share of whatever share of the business you've got. So I'm really pleased that that's come around and there's more opportunities for young guys now. Sorry, when I say young guys, I mean young people. And that's, I'm quite happy that I've now realised that maybe a little bit late and, and are proactively seeking that for myself. So if I'm, let's say I'm a young pharmacist that's just yep. fresh out of uni, I've you know just got my registration done, I know that in 10 years' time I would like to own a pharmacy. What would yep. you tell me to do? What would you, as, as a mentor, what would your advice be to me in terms of how to steer my career towards that? What Give me like step-by-step, step, what, what should I do? Sure. Look, first of all, I don't think you need to wait 10 years. It depends on the person. You know, if you want to go, if, if a journey you say, well, I'm, I think I'll be ready in 10 years, it's fine. So first of all, I'd attach yourself to the right job. I'd, I'd investigate. And look, it, it, for young pharmacists now, because there's so many jobs out there, you can be picky. You can actually almost, and I've, it's happened to me, almost do a reverse interview. Say, why should I work for you? So that's number one. Then I would be having those conversations with your boss owner early. Say, I am interested in, in ownership. I might be interested in five years. What's the path? What, how you can support me? I also strongly advise to consider doing a, a MBA or a, bachelor, a business degree or some type of business course that help. And there's many out there that helps you learn that. And I find doing those courses while you're working be very beneficial. I, I did a bachelor of business. I was halfway through before I realised I should have done an MBA, so I just finished it. Um, yeah. But you know, you can do it. You can do an MBA in three, four years, and I think that's a great benefit on its own. It's not, but when you're working, you're doing that course, you can connect the ideas and things. That's not for everyone. I'd say you have to do that. But from what I've seen, uh, successful young guys, got to stop saying guys, young people yeah. coming through that that's been quite successful and I've seen many get into ownership but have that under their belt. So in terms of then, in terms of sort of ownership structures, because this might not be something that's obvious to say a younger pharmacist just coming sure. into the world, how does that work in terms of, you know, looking into owning, you know, let's say I've saved up 50 to 100 grand, right? Yep. How much of a pharmacy can I purchase and what yep. in terms of, you know, a share and what does it look like in terms of paying that off? How does that sort of all work? Yeah, sure. Look, good question. There's a number of ways you can do it. The, the ways that we're looking at doing it is, so pharmacies are at least a million dollars, at least. And, and you go up, 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 up. So let's say that um, there's a $2 million business. The pharmacist has offered, the owner has offered 20% to come in as a, as a, as a managing partner. It's going to cost you about $400,000. Now, your costs on top of that to come in, stamp duty legals uh, can be quite a bit, and, and that might be another, let's say, 40, 50 grand. So you need to borrow 400,000 unless you've got cash to put in, but let's say you need 400,000, you should be funding your own expenses, stamp duty legals and all that. Let's say you're borrowing the 400,000, you can, there's some models where you can secure that against the value of the business. And this is where you work with the right owners to, to, to do that. Because if you're a young you're a young person and you go to the bank and say, I want 400,000, they go, well, where's my collateral? What, what have I got none? Well, I'm not giving you any money. Mm -hmm. So helping with the owner to secure that, then you want to know how you can service it. So yeah. you, you're paying generally a business loans over at least 10, 10 years, but it might be 10 to 15. So how much is that going to cost me a month? I want to get some comfort 
but I'm going to get profit share from my business to at least cover those loan repayments. So that's one way. There are other ways, but you've got to be careful. Young ones fall in the trap of the um, ownership and I'm an owner. You've got to understand how you're going to pay for it. And again, I've made mistakes that way as well. So go in, ask the questions. How much money do I need? How am I going to pay for my loan? How is the loan going to be secured? What guarantee are you going to give me that I can at least have enough drawings to cover my loan payments each month? Because if those drawings stop, how am I going to pay a monthly loan payment? Is that sort of the question you mean? Yeah, no, yeah. That, that definitely, that that's exactly what I was asking. Um, yeah. Because I think, like I said, if you're a pharmacist who, as an employee rather than an owner, yeah. and you haven't quite yeah. been ex- exposed to that world, it can be yeah. very difficult to understand how this is all sort of structured if you Absolutely. haven't had that exposure. So, yeah, no, that's that that definitely makes a lot of sense. And then you can also add, you know, what's what option do I have to buy more? How do we oh. value that if I... You know, I give you an option to buy 20% more over five years, just picking random. How are we going to value that? Right. One of the most common things I've seen over my years is, but if I work harder and the business does better, if I go to buy more, it's going to cost me more. So you need to deal with those things up front. Well, you know, it's it's yeah. natural, but you don't want to, you don't want to, the owner doesn't want something where the junior partner's company is not working as hard as they can because they're worried about the business being more. So, so sorting out those things early on, I mean, clear, you know, it could be an agreed valuation held for a couple of years if you want to buy in. It could be other, you know, there's, there's lots of mechanisms. Use a really important, I think, to use a pharmacy, a, a lawyer that understands pharmacy, so a specialist in pharmacy and also an accountant it's quite good to use a, um, an accountant. Uh, well, I'd actually highly recommend using a, a pharmacy specific accountant. There's a number of them out there. When it comes to valuation, if if they don't understand pharmacy and how you value pharmacies, and this has happened to me way back, where they go, well, I don't think that valuation's right, it should be this, but they didn't understand pharmacy, what the metrics were. So what's the return on investment that I should be getting to value a pharmacy? So you look at the profit and loss and you say, it's making X amount of profit once I strip out all the things that um, I need to, then at, let's say, 20% return, that's how much the business is worth. Now, a pharmacy-specific accountant knows that and they know what's fair and and sometimes you'll lose that in a non-pharmacy-specific accountant. Right. Interesting. So, I mean, it, it absolutely is important to find professionals that are like niche down enough to understand this yeah. particular industry. You've mentioned mistakes, which we'll get to, and yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely fascinated by that. But even in terms of just taking it one step back, when you were talking about servicing the loan, I'm interested to, to find out a little bit more about that, because I think that could be a question that pharmacists have in terms of having this loan and servicing the loan. Is that what are you drawing out from in order to be able to service that loan? So are you still taking out a salary and then the, you're taking out the profits of the business in order to service the loan or how would that kind of work? Look, to, to, to me, the way it should be, and most are like this, you're managing a store, you should be paid the same amount whether you're the managing partner or just a manager. So you should be getting a wage to live on. That shouldn't change uh, whether you're a part, whether you've got a skin in the game or not. So the... To service the loan, you'd hope you'd be getting enough profit out of the business to service the loan on top of your wage. Okay. That's the aim. Now, that's very hard if you decide to go into a greenfield site, and I'd never suggest someone does that unless they've got cash behind and they're willing to take the risk. So a greenfield site's a new pharmacy where you go and start from zero. You really don't know. You can, you can guess. It's never the guess. So you, you don't know what your cash flow is going to be like. So... Yeah. Again, for young pharmacists, I'd highly suggest that if, if they want to buy in, they're buying into a mature business that has steady cash flow, steady sales. If, if, if there's a positive increase, fantastic. If there's a bit of a negative increase, a de- decrease over a couple of years, I'd be questioning where it's going and why that's happening. Established pharmacies are much safer. If you want a greenfield and you're willing to take a risk and a gamble, you have to have cash behind you if you're not getting drawings to pay for your loans. And that's fine if you want to do that. It's, you know, it's like, it's almost like the share market. Do you have high risk investments or low risk investments? Um, yeah. And um, I've, I've had both over the years. Um, and I have been in greenfield sites where 
we've needed to put extra cash in and at times I've been in a position where I haven't had that and that's really hard when you're in partnerships. So you need to think about how you're going to, how you're going to handle that. That sounds like a, a potential mistake that a rookie pharmacist could make without the wisdom of someone like you. So moving yeah. into moving into mistakes, I'm curious yeah. about the top, let's say three mistakes that you would say you would, you know, tell me don't, don't, don't make these mistakes. Yeah, sure. I think number one is not having a tighter grip on the finances, budgets and, and monitoring them really accurately. Some of the early mistakes I, I made was significant overspends and get carried away with what we were trying to achieve. And everything you spend should, you should think, how am I going to get a return? How am I going to service it? So num- yeah, number one, definitely conservative on your expenses. Number two is be very confident in who you use for advice. So you'll always have someone telling you what you want to hear. You'll always have someone telling you, if you're, especially if you're paying them, what you, what you want to hear. So choose the right people to listen to, be accountants, lawyers, advisors, and make sure you understand and know that they know your industry. And I've made good choices there and I've made bad choices. So be very careful who you choose to give you advice is, is the second mistake that I've made because I've made some, some there that have been costly. And I think the third thing absolutely is have it very clear with, if you're in partnership and owners of a good partnership agreement and all the different options have been nutted out and you're absolutely clear on what you're in there for, what the other person's there in for, how much cash you need, a very accurate picture of where you're going with a business partner. I know they're a little bit sort of specific, but I've made mistakes on those and they can be costly. So what would your advice be when it comes to partnerships? What would your advice be in terms of making sure that those partnership agreements are like rock solid? Yeah, you, you, getting back to what I said before, using a pharmacy specific solicitor that um, yeah. understands partnership agreements. I've, I've seen, and I've been in businesses where there's no partnership agreement. You never do that again. I mean, it's really important to have a partnership agreement. That's that's some um, very very important advice, I think, because making that wrong decision can. <laughs> Can, yeah, they're not expensive. They're not hard to put yeah. together. Um, but you need a detailed, detailed one that deals with what if this, you know, what what if one of the partners dies? Yeah. How does it, how's, how's that dealt with? What happens if one of the partners wants to sell a share of their business? Do the other partner get first option? Does it go to, you know, all those types of things? For example, with a managing partner that um, the model I talked about earlier on, how long? Do you, if you come in as a 20, 30% managing partner, how long are you committed to stay in that business and be the managing partner? Yeah. You don't want to, an owner doesn't want to do that. And after one year, the managing partner says, oh, I'm, I'm moving. You know, well, how's it, how's your share dealt with? Ask those questions up front before you get in. You, you can't anticipate all questions, but you, 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 certainly an experienced lawyer can detail what the common things are that should be in a partnership agreement and and it, it needs to be a discussion between the parties and make sure it's reflected in that agreement before you go into business, not something that's done afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I can, yeah, I feel like that's definitely something that every pharmacist needs to be, you know, yeah, we should think about. So yeah, that, that's really good advice. I have so many questions to ask you. I'm just having a look at your LinkedIn profile and I've just realized we've just been talking about pharmacy ownership for 27 minutes. <laughs> And there are so many incredible things that you've done that I would really love to dive into, but it totally depends on how much time you have. I'm good at the moment. I'm good for another 20. Perfect. Awesome. Tour of the tropics. Talk to us about that. That sounds like a really cool... Oh, look, I'm a cycling nut and okay. um, cycled when I was young and then forgot about it and then realised I was getting old. And, and so I got back into cycling about 10 years ago and my um, love of sitting on boards and I love being on boards and chairing boards and I got sucked in at a week time into this and it's it's a um, semi-professional cycling race with rated riders as well we had to cancel this year unfortunately because of um, because of some of the pro teams pulling out but yeah just just using my skills in an area I'm passionate about and love cans love cycling love leading and helping with things so yeah i did actually notice you're you're on the board of a few a few different organizations but you're on the board of the phn is that the northern yeah i was chair of that for a number of years and i really really enjoyed that phn's federal money you know i think our budget was about 100 million dollars that goes to primary health care 
Um, I love that. It was a really good experience seeing how that money is distributed. Unfortunately, not always achieving what you want to, but you can see also some of the problems with delivering, especially to Indigenous health, mental health. There's a long, long, long way to go. And I suppose it comes down to what's, what's your passion about my work. And I love being, um, you know, way back to when I was young, I just liked being in those leadership positions. And this is a way I can see that I can keep myself motivated, one, um, and try to, 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 to give back some of the things, most of the things I said on a voluntary, that one wasn't, but that's what I want to do more of in the future. But I also um, have a tendency to do too much. And my wife, wife keeps reminding me, do you have time for this? Do you have time for this? <laughs> so, Again, I've learned that way, and hopefully, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to get stuck. You're always always been asked to sit on the board of something. I go, no, don't have time. So I've learned how to say no. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's funny because I was going to ask exactly the same question. Like I said, yeah. having looked at your profile, I'm like, where do you find the time? How do you find the time to be, you know, have so many hats on at the same time? Like, how do you structure your time to be able to do this? Yeah, thing? look, it's sometimes, and and certainly, I am spread myself too thin at times. So. It's a balance between keeping yourself motivated, doing what you love, and also making sure that you've got enough time and focus for your business. Now, I've certainly had that balance wrong in the past. And in the end, you can sit on voluntary boards, you can sit on that, but you need to make sure you're looking after what your investments. I've got millions of dollars in pharmacy, and that should be my primary focus. And it's a, it's a challenge because you've also got to keep yourself motivated and, and fresh. So I was president of the Cairns Chamber of Commerce for a number of years, and that probably took up 20 hours a week and it was really hard. That was a voluntary position. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But it was really hard to strike that balance between making sure you're doing a good job there and not being taken away from your business. I'm also a firm believer in if you want something done, give it to someone that's busy. Yeah. Um, but there's limitations to that yeah. culture and it doesn't always work. I feel like there's a fine line. It's like you've got to be busy, but like not too busy. And it's just like it's 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 that that sweet spot you've got got to get to, right? Without overwhelming yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you and again you learn. You learn um through mistakes. I've you know, I've sat on a, a James Cook University board for pharmacy now for twelve years, which is fantastic and I love I love being involved in that, but it doesn't take too much of my time. I feel like I'm giving back and I'm contributing to my industry that I love so that those types of things are, are, are quite rewarding have you seen what what that what's that been like in terms of being in academia for for the last 12 years so you're not are you an academic so do you do you go in and actually teach or are you on the advisory no. board of that I'm a chair of the advisory board which sort of connects the different aspects of the pharmacy industry so that you know the pharmacy guild PSA the hospital pharmacies indigenous health to try and give the university degree for pharmacy a good snapshot of what's happening out there. And, you know, I've worked with some fantastic people at uni. I mean, we're exciting times at the moment in regard to increased scope of practice. Um, James Cook University is delivering one of those increased scope of practice courses and the, the course is moving to five years. There's changes happening. It's an M, going to be a master's. There's even potential in the future that you're going to come out with a, a, a you know, doctorate in front of your name. All those things are really exciting for our industry. Um, excite keep, keeps me uh, motivated as well. How is the with you know everything that's been happening with sixty day dispensing and and all that? What what's that been like for you to navigate as a as an owner? Yeah, look. First of all, I've got to say what a horrible decision. Yeah, it was poorly done, poorly managed. I think also on some of our industry sides as well. Just just really bad policy. So. You know, we did all the reports to see the potential impact. It's it's not surprisingly slow at the moment, but it's going to impact the bottom line on all our businesses. We're thankfully most of our businesses are quite strong in the retail, and all our businesses are growing. But to rip out, I can't remember what the average is. But I think it's over a hundred thousand dollars off the bottom line of pharmacy turns businesses from profit to, to losses. I know in Cairns itself, I know couple of businesses that have stopped trading after hours. They've cut back on staff, they've increased prices on packing, they've increased prices on delivery. So who loses in the end? The consumer. So it's been tough. The impacts haven't been seen as of yet. I think there's a huge fingers crossed that the next Guild Government Agreement is going to address those issues because I know there's a lot of pressure on the Guild to, to come up with a good agreement and the, and the federal government, obviously, because 
there is a lot of community pharmacies that are at risk of closing, which the, the community is going to lose. So yeah, it's been stressful. I just, I'm just shaking my head at the whole thing. When you, when the health, federal health minister stands up and says, these pharmacies are really, really valuable. So it's not a problem we cut there. You know, it's just, it's just horrible to hear. Yes, some pharmacies are valuable and earn money, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot on the line. I've always had, I'm not sure if I've ever had all my stores firing at once. There's always one or two that um, are dragging the chain and I'm lucky I've got good businesses that can help support them. So yeah, I, I, I angry, but channeling to well, what can we do to protect our businesses and make sure we still deliver services to our customers. Yeah. If a pharmacy is struggling with that, what would be your recommendation for helping them get through? You've got to look at everything. You've got to look at your pricing. You've got to look at the services you deliver. You've got to look at your staffing. You need to know what potentially you're going to lose. Now, the reports say you potentially could lose, let's say, 100 grand, or if you only a certain percentage of your business switches to 60 days, scripts to 60 days, you might lose 50 grand. So you need to have policy, you need to have strategies on how you deal with the 50 or the 100 and look at your P&L. You go, well, if I lose that whole 100, how am I going to survive? What mm. do I need to do? Do I need to cut hours? Do I need to, you know, do I need to find 50 grand in staff savings? Do I need to increase my pricing? And I say, well, there's a hell of a lot of increase in pricing to cover this. And again, um, you know, you, you had... You had our federal minister sort of almost threaten, how can you know, don't retail pharmacies not let increase their pricing or start charging people services. It's, you can't do that. It's business. We're not like government where we can lose money and doesn't matter how much money because someone's going to pick it up. You know, this is commercial reality. It drives me nuts when you get the um, some of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be careful with my wording. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a bit of a it's a touchy subject, isn't it? I feel like yeah, it's become yeah. it's become such a minefield. I. I how would you, would you, would that change your recommendations for a young pharmacist thinking about going into pharmacy in terms of the viability of growing a pharmacy? Do you think yeah, this is look, going to that, that's a good question? I've had that before. Um, I just want to, before I answer that, I just want to say there's some good, good outcomes for certain patients in the 60 day. I don't doubt that. What our argument is about, well, if you're going to do that, why should the, why should you undermine the structure of retail pharmacy? delivery in Australia, which is one of the best in the world. So that's on yeah. that. Good to hear that so far valuations for pharmacies are holding up because we're still in a growth, not everyone, but you know, there's still opportunities to grow and make up for that. If you manage that well, depending on the business, I'm not seeing valuations. I was talking to some people in Melbourne last week and they're saying the valuations are holding up, that we think that we'll get through this. The eight CPA that's, that is supposed to be delivered, so it's next skill government agreement by March next year will answer a lot of questions that you might have about where's the industry going with 60 day and what impact it's going to have on us in the long term. Depending on the type of business, if it's a high group business and you, and the modelling showing you're going to lose a lot, might even be worthwhile seeing what comes out of that guild government agreement. But most pharmacies that you're going to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be worried. Because I think there's ways to manage it and make up for it. Okay. I think that that's probably heartening to know for any aspiring yeah. pharmacy entrepreneurs. But a month ago, it was a month or two ago, I was going, what about people coming into businesses? It was a real worry. And it's still some uncertainty. Um, yeah. But no, I think, I, think, I think we'll be all right. I think, I think this is probably a good place to, to ask this question and start to wrap up. And that is for a pharmacy, aspiring pharmacy entrepreneur, I feel like I asked, I, I, we kind of circled around this question earlier, but like, what are the three sort of, what are three things you would say to them right now in terms of, you know, motivating them to, to continue down that path? For, for ownership? For ownership, yeah. Yeah, just absolutely 100% attach yourself to the right people. If you think you're with someone that there's no guarantee of partnership, they've got no trick history of being a partnership, they might have questionable business practices. There's so many opportunities. Go grab a better one. Yeah. Interview your your interview your um, and when I say interview, you know, research, find out about the potential bosses or opportunities. There's heaps out there. So that 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 would be um, number two. Um, show you can have the capacity to save some money. It doesn't okay. have to be a lot but you should be able to save 50 to 100 grand minimum. That is important to show potential partners that you've got 
you, you need to cover your um, legal expenses and stamp duty coming into something. And I think it's really important to do that. And that's hard for some young people. But if you're serious and committed to being a pharmacy owner, mm. show you can save some money, show you've got come in with some money. I think that's really important. I, I'm hearing that being financially savvy is the top skill for aspiring pharmacy entrepreneurs. This is what I'm hearing from you. So I feel like yeah, it's look, a good thing, yeah. yeah, if you, you want to go into business, it's not there's, there's two two main skills coming into being a farm. You'd be a good pharmacist, professional person, excellent. But if you want to be an owner, you've got to have good business yeah. skills. Now you need those two things. You got you got to have those two things. If you just want to be a good pharmacist, not interested in business, maybe don't be a business owner. But in saying that, sometimes you can be attached to the right person that can says, "Don't worry about the finances. I'll do it. I'll make sure I show you everything. You just be a good pharmacist." So, but there's not as many of those opportunities. I think most potential aspiring entrepreneurs and pharmacy owners should understand finance. I feel like this is just going to open up a whole other conversation that I'm like, I don't think we have time to get into, but I would, I would love to at some point deep delve deeper into that. If you're, sure. if you're open to it. I That's love talking so, about this. So, you know, it's, as you can see, I'll keep going on. So. I love it. I feel like I've just learned so much just in the last half an hour. So I feel like if we have another deep dive, I can just learn so much more. And, you know, our, our, the people listening can, will learn so much as well. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, this has been amazing. It's been really insightful. Yeah. So where, so where can people find you if they want to follow you or find out more about you? Yeah, um, I'm on LinkedIn. So um, just under um, Nick Lucas, I think it is, or Nicholas. It's, it's L-O-U-K-A-S not the normal okay. way. Um, so LinkedIn's the best way to connect with me. And I, I, I'm not getting more active on LinkedIn. I certainly, um, if you message me, um, I'm always um, keeping an eye on my messages on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, we'll have the link to that in the show notes. So anyone who wants to find you can reach out. Fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Hope you have an awesome rest of your day. See ya. See you later.